Hello, and welcome to the continuing series on Bergson and his holographic theory of mind. This will be part 11 on artificial intelligence and the singularity. The singular concept, shall we say, that at some point, artificial intelligences, robots, will achieve equality with human intelligence, then exceed it, and of course, then we're faced with serious consequences as to whether we maintain control of the planet. So we'll be talking about the true criterion derived from Bergson for an intelligent conscious device. And in this, we'll be touching on what real intelligence actually is and what its basis is and what real threat might be simultaneously. <clears throat> So I began with a article I just ran across in Discover Magazine, April 2017, entitled Artificial Intelligence, AI, Can We Build Machines with Common Sense? And the author of the article begins with a little scenario or scene at uh, Paul Allen's, one of the founders of Microsoft, his AI2 company where a researcher rolls a pencil on his table and notes, a machine can't say whether it will fall off the table. And thus bringing in the whole difficulty that current AI has with common sense, simple things like pencils rolling off the table, how things look when coffee are stirred, etc. When coffee is stirred. And the Article goes on and discusses AlphaGo, which is a program that recently defeated the human Go champion. And of course, this was one of the last bastions of games that seemed to be invulnerable to AI and has now fallen. The difficulty that the author notes is that the program only works for Go. That is, it's narrow, it's specific to this game, it's completely non-general. And in general, this is the general problem, that we don't really have general intelligence, which includes common sense. One AI program that's discussed in the article, and it's about a four-page article, by the way, uh, and it's a competition winner, among AI programs involved uh, trying to pass a science test. And the program got 59% on this science test involving multiple choice questions, diagrams, open questions, reading comprehension questions. To do this, they built a database. It consisted of 5,000 annotated science diagrams 15,000 multiple choice questions. Algorithms were built to interpret images, diagrams, of course, blocks of text. And they hope eventually this program will be able to read scientific papers. So this looks good, but hovering in the background, of course, is the admitted weakness of common sense. The very simple problem of can pencils roll off tables. The last half of the article, however, was spent on worries over the dangers of AI. And this echoes, of course, the distinctly worry, echoes distinctly the worry du jour, namely the singularity, when AI and robots exceed human intelligence and then proceed to eat us for breakfast. So the fear of singularity trades on a greatly amped up, sped up human intelligence. We understand what we are capable of doing. And therefore, this we could fear, this greatly amped up, sped up human intelligence. But if your machine can't even design a decent mousetrap, it's not a threat, even to mice, 
let alone humans. But most trip design is common sense knowledge. And common sense, as we've seen over the last several parts of the series, relies on several things. It relies on solving the problem of perception. Thus, it's going to rely on Bergson's reconstructive wave notion of the brain. It's going to rely on the fact that perceived dynamic concrete events are defined by invariant structures, not Wikipedia text. It's going to rely on the fact that thought really consists of dynamic transformations of images. That is, it's broadly computational. It relies on the achievement of cost, or the complex of concepts in what I term cost, causality, object, space, and time. And part of this complex is explicit memory and the ability to support the symbolic. Where symbolic is quite different than AI thinks it is, all requiring an articulated simultaneity and an indivisible flow of time. It's going to require that the abstract be treated as invariance over the concrete. That is, the abstract does not exist without the storage, so to speak, retaining of concrete experience. In other words, storage then of the entirety of experience, that is, on four-dimensional being. And then it relies on analogy, the true ability to do analogy, which relies on all of the above. So I'm going to take you through what I would consider the requirements, and there'll be 12 of them, for a truly intelligent device. The first one, the first requirement, that the global dynamics of this device must support a reconstructive wave. That's to say the brain as a device is a modulated reconstructive wave passing through the holographic universal field. And as we've seen in Bergson's model, the brain supported wave is specific to a source in this field, the pyramid ball, as in the picture there in the virtual image, Uh, a coffee cup, a stirring spoon, because these are uh, dynamic events that are being specified, and the object, the cup, the ball, is right where it says it is, within the external field. There is no image in the brain, no representation of the world, no mini model of the world within the brain. This requires a device where we achieve a concrete dynamics, because we're talking about a very concrete reconstructive wave, a real wave in a real field. So as concrete as that of an AC motor generating a field of force. That is, it's not just software, it's going to require real engineering. Number two. The total dynamics of the system must be proportionally related to the events, particularly the micro events, of the matter field, such that a scale of time is defined upon this field. So this dynamics establishes a ratio, an E slash O ratio, where E stands for the external environment events, and O for the internal organism processing events. And this ratio establishes buzzing flies at our normal scale of time versus heron-like flies as we increase the velocity of processes versus motionless flies at yet another, lo another level of process velocity increase. So we have an increasing Velocity of processes are increasing energy state, corresponding lowering of the E slash O ratio, that is, 
more events being processed. As we go, less and less blur the fly. Now the specification is to the past, to past portion of the indivisible motion of the field, and as we've seen at a scale of time. That is, it's a specification to a past extent or portion of the indivisible transformation of the field. For in this field, there are no instants. In this flow, there are no instants that fall into non-existence as the present instant arise, arrives. And for the quality aficionados, the hard problem followers, note the scale of time is qualia or qualitative. Each of the flies, the buzzing fly, the heron like fly, the near motionless fly is a different quality. And the holographic field itself, as it is being specified, is a qualitative field. So without this ability of the system, of, of the device, to specify scale, one cannot have qualitative experience. Three, the dynamics of the system must be structurally related to the events of the matter field. That is, this dynamics must be reflective of the invariance laws defined over the time extended events of the field. Again, as we discussed, and I note down here, I'm noting in the, in the bottom right hand corner, the parts of the series that have touched on these. So this is all being touched on in parts one, two, and three. The events have a dynamic time extended invariance structure. For example, coffee stirring. We noted there is an adiabatic ratio as we stir, an energy of oscillation to frequency of oscillation. This is an invariance over real physical forces. It doesn't exist in Wikipedia text. There is an inertial tensor, which involves the angular momentum of the spoon. There's a radial flow field defined over the coffee surface. The cup size constancy or height constancy is an invariance defined as a ratio of height to texture gradient as the cup would move back and forth over the texture gradient. And even the form of the cup is a function of flow fields with velocity gradients as this cup moves. This, we noted, is information that modulates the brain as a reconstructive wave. So this being the invariant structure of events is the information that modulates the brain as a reconstructive wave to specify these events in the external holographic field. Four, the information resonant over the dynamical structure or states of this device must integrally include relation to or feedback from systems for the preparation of action. Four, from the vast information in the holographic field the principle of selection of this information is via relation to possible action by the body. That is, perception must be virtual action, as Bergson noted. In other words, perception must be the display of possible action. And the implication here is if we were to drop a set of catalysts into the device that increase the energy state of the device, the processing velocity. Then the buzzing fly of our normal scale must transfer, say, to a heron-like fly, barely flapping his wings and specifying the possibility of action, reaching out slowly and grasping the fly by the wing in the scale. Or for the cat, the mouse now moves slowly as he moves from point A to point D, sig signaling to the cat, specifying as perception that the cat has more time to initiate the act, the leap, to intercept the mouse at D. So this new perception must reflect 
the new possibility of action in this scale. This perception must do so to be ecologically valid. Else we have anomalies of perception in relation to action. The cat leaps and fails miserably because he was being fooled by his perception. So it is the body or the devices we're talking about, capability or possibility of action, as we noted, that is the selection principle when the vast information in the external holographic field. Number five, the operative dynamics of the system must be an integral part of the indivisible, non-differentiable motion of the matter field in which it is embedded, which is to say the dynamics of the system must be truly embedded within the invisible, indivisible or non-differentiable motion of the field. Now, operative is the key, operative dynamics. The operative dynamics cannot be abstract operations, that is syntax rules manipulation, in an abstract space, in an abstract time, that can be achieved by any number of devices with totally different dynamics, as long as the abstract operations are achieved. That is, as of so many times, if I can achieve the same thing with an abacus or with a Turing machine with an infinite tape or a register machine, as Dennett pointed out, made of beans and shoeboxes, then my operative dynamics is truly nothing more than an inference engine, a rule manipulator. I need nothing more. So such a dynamics is simply implementing the classic metaphysic. That is, it's non-ontological and utterly external to the indivisible flow of time. Such dynamics cannot avail itself of the primary memory defined over this flow of time or the transformation of the material field. And it's this memory, this indivisible flow, which allows the specification of time extended events as past transformations of the field, winging butterflies or falling twisting leaves. And as we saw in the parts I'm noting there, particularly part two and part three, trying to account for the perception of time extended events and perception, buzzing flies, butterflies flying by is virtually impossible without this particular conception. Number six, past experiences are retrieved from the four dimensional holographic field. Experience is not occurring solely within the brain in the device that we're describing, or in the AI device. Remember, it is a specification of events within the external field. Therefore, it cannot be solely stored there, that is, within the brain. The entirety of experience is therefore available for retrieval. Number seven, the operative dynamics of memory retrieval must rely on the invariant structure of events as the modulating mechanism of the device, that is of the reconstructive wave. That is, it must support the operation of redintegration via the invariant structure of events. It is the invariant structure of events that modulates the brain as a reconstructive wave. Retrieving similarly structured events, experience from the four dimensional field. For example, a rustle in the grass, a certain pattern of event, a rustling in the grass, redintegrates an earlier experience of seeing a snake. Or a lightning strike, redintegrates a childhood experience of lightning striking the house. But these are structured events forcing the brain into a modulation pattern that reconstructs 
the earlier experience. This is the dynamics that is required. I'm going to continue on seven for a moment because there's a bit more to unpack here. So fulfilling this requirement on memory retrieval is needed for the frame problem that was plaguing AI for some time until it was rather conveniently buried as a problem. <clears throat> Not that the problem actually was ever solved. In the frame problem, the best way to put it is we have a robot observing coffee stirring. In fact, while he himself is stirring the coffee. While stirring the coffee, the surface explodes in little geysers. Or the liquid now feels like cement, such that he can barely move the spoon through it. Or the cup, be cup begins bulging or expands and contracts as he stirs. Or the spoon starts to melt. Or the coffee goes snap, crackle, pop. The question is, are these expected features of the event? How does the robot know? Or here's another little one on this left side there. Is that an expected feature of soccer? Well, the robot must check his frame axioms. And I note at what scale of time, every microsecond, every tenth of a second, every one hundredth of a second. And the frame axioms are the list of things that do not change. For example, here we have a small set of frame axioms for coffee stirring. And they say that the cup remains the same size, or and the cup remains stable, or the cup remains at the same elevation as I stir. And these could go on and on. And they have to hold for other things that do not change. The President of the United States does not change. The world does not turn from round to flat, etc. So there's a long list of frame axioms that have to be checked at some scale of time. And this has been considered, to this point, computationally intractable. That's precisely how to state the frame problem. How does a robot check his frame axioms such that it is not computationally intractable? But for the device we're talking about, these things are simply violations of the invariance structure. The bulging in and out of the coffee cup are violations. The sudden eruption of the surface into geysers are violations of the invariance structure of the event. The invariance structure of the event is defined across the entirety of 4D experience, stored experience of these events. So these violations are detected instantly as a felt dissonance, a failure to resonate with the invariant structure of the event. We throw in the brain into a modulation pattern that doesn't correspond with the standard resonance, standard invariant structure of the coffee stirring event. And it's felt instantly. This is not an abstraction. We're talking about a felt dissonance that is part of the standard requirements of this device. Note that these frame axioms must extend to multiple embedded context. While stirring coffee, six turkeys walk by my window. Is this expected? Yes, in my farm context. The garbage truck arrives. Is this expected? Yes, in the farm context in dealing with garbage. It begins to rain. Is this expected? Well, yes. The wife comes downstairs. Expected in the domestic context? Yes. And the propane delivery truck backs down the driveway toward the propane tank. Expected in the context of the energy structure of this farm? Yes. So all this could happen at once. To 
process this all as expected, the device must possess the entirety of a living being's normal experience. That is, all possible context that could be rolled in, shall we say, while I'm stirring this for a little cup of coffee. Number eight, the operative dynamics must support abstraction as a function of invariance defined over concrete experience or the figural mode. So we've already touched upon this. It is redintegration across the events of experience having a similar invariance structure that defines abstractions. That is the abstraction of stirring or the abstraction of spoon, even the abstraction of coffee. That is the abstract is always defined over the concrete. The abstract does not exist without the concrete experiences. That is, this requires the storage and detail of all events, all experience. Number nine, the operative dynamics must achieve a developmental trajectory supporting cost, explicit memory, and a symbolic function. So these are three simultaneous things that must be developed over time. For Piaget, this requires two years. Cost is the base set of concepts, causality, object, space, and time, where space and time are abstract schemas on space and time. Explicit memory is the ability to consciously localize events as events in one's past. And the symbolic function involves the ability to use a current event to symbolize a previous event in one's past, implying that if one does not understand that the event is in one's past, one doesn't have the ability to symbolize. So this is a complex set or a complex of concepts and abilities that, that evolve on a developmental trajectory requiring for Piaget two years as we start on part five. One example Piaget gave was his little Jacqueline who was 19 months old. She picks up a blade of grass, which she puts in a pail as if it were one of the grasshoppers. A little cousin brought her a few days before and she says, to tell, or short for French, sauterelle or grasshopper. To tell, to tell, jump boy, talking to her cousin. In other words, the perception of an object, which reminds her symbolically of a grasshopper, enables her to evoke past events and reconstruct them in sequence. Again, I stress in this requirement, this is a trajectory, developmental trajectory that the device has to go through to achieve these concepts. They are not born and given out of nothing. Number 10, the operative, dy operative dynamics must support an articulated simultaneity within the non-differential flow of time. This is required for the symbolic function noted previously, as well as for explicit memory. That is, the little Jacqueline was seen, the blade of grass, and Homer there, and it reminds simultaneously of the grasshopper. This is what I am terming an articulated simultaneity. The, you have the grass blade and the grasshopper in a simultaneous relationship where one represents the other. This requires a, a device embedded within the non-differentiable flow of time to, to achieve this articulated simultaneity. This is what is truly required for true symbolic function. Furthermore, as we noted with Kassir, it is required support to support analogy. 
For we, in analogy, we have to have the simultaneous dwelling in one meaning and another. In fact, what we're looking at there, right there with Homer, with the grass and the grasshopper is already an analogy. It's already an analogical reminding. The grass reminding us analogically of a grasshopper. Continuing with requirement 10 and the requirement for the symbolic function, we note Piaget's experiments, for example, this little one with seriating or ordering sticks from high to low, carried out with ages, children of ages three to seven. And in the experiment, the original series A is presented to the children and they're asked to reproduce that seriated series from memory. So B shows their initial attempts at around age three. C row shows attempts later on, say ages four to five. And then the D row shows a little bit closer yet, a little bit better seriation. And then finally, by age seven, they can indeed reproduce the original series A. But in other words, this takes some time. It takes development. Why is that? Well, to seriate these sticks, where in this case, A, B, and C denote sticks, where A has to be higher than B and B higher than C, one must simultaneously relate or coordinate the height of B relative to A and the height of B relative to C. So we have a pure problem of representation where B is simultaneously less than A and greater than C. Or to order these flows of the flow of water into these beakers from the top beaker filling up the bottom beaker gradually. Again, the children struggle to reconstruct this flow. If that flow is cut up into a series of pictures, the Ds, D1, D2, D3, each being a picture, the children originally struggle to order even this. If the series is cut up even more such that you have the Is and the Bs, as though you cut a, took a scissors and cut that whole thing in half, and then so I had a whole series of Is and Ds, it gets even worse. The difficulty, again, is to order these flows, the child must construct a series where A precedes B precedes C, where the, Aries, the arrows carry a dual or simultaneous meaning, standing for precedes as well as follows. Again, a pure problem of representation of simultaneity in time. Number 11. Analogy must be supported as the operation which defines features or concepts, not vice versa. That is, the analogy defines the features, not features define the analogy. So again, this is a requirement for the device. This is how analogy has to be treated. Analogy defines the features. And we discussed the example of making a mousetrap out of a set of components as pictured up on the right corner there. String, rubber bands, paper clips, razor blades, staples, etc. And in the crossbow mousetrap, we're doing an analogical creation of a device where the invariant structure of an event, shooting a crossbow, is projected upon the possible components. And in this, the features emerge. The possible anchoring of the box sides for the rubber bands, the piercing, the sharpness of the pencil. Or if we were to create a mouse beheader where the little pencil axe there in the bottom right corner is wedged into the corner of the box, then the wedging anchoring of the box corner becomes emerges as a feature. 
or the rigidity now of the pencil as opposed to its piercing capability, the downward force of the rubber bands as opposed to their pushing, as repelling force as, as in a crossbow. Analogy is the foundation of common sense knowledge of categories of concepts, as Hofstetter and Sander argued brilliantly in their little book, Surfaces and Essence, or their big book, Surfaces and Essences of 2013, or as they put it, analogy is the fuel and fire of thinking. One has to be able to handle analogy as a dynamic transformation of the projection of events upon other events. To continue with this, integration, the other operation we argued is requirement for the, for the device, is intrinsically analogical. It is analogical reminding. It is the operation that Hofstetter and Sanders sought at the basis of analogy. As Eric Dietrich remarked in an article, Dietrich being an AI theorist, he, he experienced seeing garbage cans in an alley and interest, in, instantly was reminded of garbage hand, garbage hinge, an, an, analog, an, an analogical reminding or snapping a pea at sister across the picnic table. I'm reminded of catapulting. These are analogical remindings. Redintegration is at the base of analogy. A device that cannot do redintegration, as was described previously, in terms of invariant structures, driving the modulation of the brain and reintegrating past experience from the 4D field is not going to make it in terms of supporting the fundamental operation of analogy. Also, as we noted, analogy relies on the symbolic function. The wind chimes I notice on my porch remind me of buying a present of wind chimes for my wife previously. Again, the wind chimes on the porch, simultaneously the chimes are both a symbol of an event, a past present to the wife, and the event themselves, just as the piece of grass, the blade of grass, and the grasshopper. You have to have the symbolic function of ability which relies on the articulated simultaneity in a non-differentiable time. Support this. 12. Cognition or thought is supported as broad computation. That is dynamic transformations of imagery defining invariance. In Penrose's example of a proof of a computation that does not stop, where we have infinity of cubical numbers via adding successive hexagonal numbers. What Penrose demonstrated as his example of non-computational, or what we can call broad computational thought, was the folding of a hexagonal number at the top there in a little picture into a three-sided cubical number and successively stacking each little three-sided cube over the previous hexagonal number, each time forming a cubical number. We start with one, we get the cubical number of eight, two by two by two, then the cubical number of 27, three by three by three, and then the cub cubical number of 64, which is four by four by four. And it's obvious that that continues ad infinitum. But this was a dynamic transformation of thought of preserving invariance. I fold each time the hexagonal, hexagonal number into a three-sided cube. Each three-sided cube preserves, each stacking of the three-sided cube preserves as an invariant the four-sided complete cube continuously. This 
is a broad computational operation. Piaget and his concrete operations and all of his demonstrations argue that these are simply increasingly schematized images or imagery transformations, where we saw that the children are showing a little tunnel with three beads, A, B, and C, that run into the tunnel. The tunnel is turned an odd or even number of times, initially say, one half turn, which reverses the order. A full turn, and, and the beads would come back out in the same order. Again, a half turn, they come back out in reverse order. And it takes them some period of time, ages three to seven, to learn the, the, the rule, where an odd number of turn reverses the order, A, B, and C, to C, B, and A, and an even number preserves the order. And they do this by imaging these turns and the order in which the beads come out until the point where these images are simply, as Piaget put it, a virtual schema of the operation necessary. They're barely visible mentally, shall we say, as what they started out initially as an image. But nevertheless, that is exactly what is required the imagery of these operations. This is what a device must support for true thought. That's the 12 requirements. These cannot be implemented, I'm going to note, save in Bergson's holographic framework. And via a device operating in his temporal metaphysic. And I'll note, there can be no thought as image transformations, as in Penrose's example above, unless you have a device that solves the origin of the image of the external world. And currently, no AI device has any model of the origin of the image of the external world. This is an absolute requirement. All of this imagery, use of imagery and thought, dynamic transformations, proceeds from and is dependent upon the solution of the problem of perception. Now, I've neglected at least one important dimension, namely the requirements for implementing voluntary action. As we've seen, as I discussed in parts nine and 10, this aspect needs more understanding. Not, I will say that any of the 12 are easy, or in fact, truly, fully understood as they need to be. So let's return to fear of singularity. For Ray Kurzweil, the singularity is 2045, not too far away. So forget making mousetraps from components and the deep problems of representational power this re represents for AI. By representational power, think the power of representing how pencils can move in, in any um, number of situations from being embedded in crossbows to beheaders and mousetraps to punji stakes, etc. What this actually means, if we're taking the singularity seriously, is that our robot will become a chef. He'll take granola bars, cherry tomatoes, cherry, cherry tomatoes, five Chinese five spice, and pilloncello, and whip up a dessert in 20 minutes, easily becoming the champion of all chop champions or Chopped is a cooking competition TV show on cable TV, and this was exactly one of their challenges, which they do over and over again. That is, take arbitrary components like this, make desserts, make main dishes, make appetizers. So maybe our 
robot will even become the Iron Chef. Now one might ask, is this an unfair extension of the Turing test to, to see if a machine is actually a human? This is the problem. This is the problem of the concrete staring us in the face. It will not be solved by scraping wiki text or examining images. And though I doubt that Ray Kurzweil would think much of the mousetrap problem, let alone the Iron Chef problem, this is the problem of common sense. As noted, an amped up high velocity human intelligence, if malevolent, we can understand as a threat. And the fear of singularity is trading on this, what we understand as human intelligence, and therefore the achieving of that. The claims made in many singularity types book, books of what an AI might do, where human intelligence isn't achieved, but some alien-like intelligence, are pure fantasies. The busy child which begins scanning the world, assessing humans as threats, for example, or the, the Skynets building their own robot armies, or machines, AIs that take over the entire global financial system. The scenarios that are presented for the capabilities of AI are huge in scope. But the burden of proof that AIs with a vague alien-like intelligence, not derived from the concrete world, not derived from its invariance laws, not derived from its actual forces, dynamics that we experience, but rather from text reading, image scanning, this burden is on AI. AI's first problem is showing it can come close to a device with human intelligence that we could understand as a threat. The requirements for this I've attempted to lay out. It's clear we would have to start engineering, or engineering indeed it will be, with something far simpler. A chipmunk's brain, a rat's brain, or a frog, or an insect. Even these are modulated reconstructive waves specifying sources slash events within the external field at their own, that is chipmunk, rat, particular scale of time. And they're relying on the primary memory of the field via its indivisible motion to specify its past transformations as buzzing flies, or butterflies leading to flowers, or creeping cats, if I'm a rat. But I hope we're not entirely worried about AI rats or AI chefs conquering the human race. On the road, still a plan talking about under education and the nature of real understanding in subject matters such as mathematics and physics. And next, we'll, we'll talk on Sartre's fail on Bergson. As I think a very uh, revealing discussion on how people can get, get can screwed up in Bergson without understanding his holographic aspect and it helps clarify some aspects of Bergson greatly, I think. Till then, signing off.